So Elden Ring got a lot of attention in 2022. Elden Ring is the latest title in From Software's long line of games that iterate and expound upon FromSoft's seminal Demon's Souls and Dark Souls. These games have been at the forefront of video game discourse for more than a decade, renowned by gamers for their brutal, punishing combat, esoteric worlds, and passionate communities. And as of midnight, December 31st, 2022, I had never played any of them. Not Dark Souls, not Sekiro, not Bloodborne, and not Elden Ring. Despite the praise all these games had received over the previous 10 years. The Souls games and their ilk have never really, at least on the surface, seemed like they'd scratch any of the particular itches that perpetually danced across my game-liking fingers. The only thing I'd really ever heard about the Souls games, and FromSoft's modern gameography more generally, is that they were hard. Some folk might qualify that with a remark about how nice the atmosphere was, but the broad strokes discussion revolved almost exclusively around Dark Souls' perceived difficulty. This discussion of difficulty was so all-consuming that it wasn't until the release of Bloodborne that I first learned that these Souls-like games actually had non-boss enemies, or big, sprawling environments. I know, that, that might sound crazy, but that's how my mind always imagined Dark Souls any time I heard people talk about it. All I'd ever heard of were the brutal, headache-inducing boss battles, so as far as I was concerned, Dark Souls and all its spin-offs were just arduous strings of boss battles, and that didn't sound like anything I wished to be a part of. I'd never considered myself to be a very good gamer. Uh, many Halo and Call of Duty multiplayer matches will back up that statement. And so anytime I heard people speak with reverent awe about how difficult Dark Souls was, the only thing I heard is that it would be too difficult for me. And why waste my time then if I'm only doomed to fail? But then, there was Bloodborne. And for whatever reason, that game, more so than any of its predecessors, seemed to be of a broader interest to the various Let's Players I was watching at the time. I watched these other people play through the game, and suddenly the Souls-like formula made a little more sense. It still didn't seem like something I'd enjoy, but I got it. I could see the allure, and thus the seed was planted. That was 2015. 2016 soon arrived, and with it a game that would soon become one of my all-time favorites, Hyperlight Drifter. I picked up Hyperlight because I was familiar with the composer, Disasterpiece, more so than any familiarity I had with the developers, or even any familiarity I might have had with the style of game it was marketed to be. But it was on my computer nonetheless, and I played it all the way through, several times over. And it wasn't until after completing the game that first time that I read any reviews for it. And I was surprised to see that more than a few people compared the gameplay of Hyperlight Drifter to that of Dark Souls. And I, I found this peculiar. I hadn't found Hyperlight to be simple by any means, but I also hadn't found it to be remarkably difficult. If I could beat Hyperlight, could I beat Dark Souls? My doubts lingered. My confidence remained shaken by my childhood friend's whispers of Dark Souls' infamous difficulty, and so I remained in ignorance. That was 2016. 2018 rolled around faster than anticipated, and also much slower given certain events that transpired in the United States in 2016, whose rot we have yet to fully excise from the fabric of our nation. And with 2018's arrival came Monster Hunter World. Now, I've talked about Monster Hunter, or as one of my friends called it, Jurassic Park for Psychopaths, here on the channel before, so I won't retread much of that material here. Suffice to say, I really enjoyed Monster Hunter World. It was my first Monster Hunter game, and once again, like with Hyper Light Drifter, once I'd beaten it, I looked up reviews. And once again, I was surprised to find people saying that the combat in Monster Hunter World was, quote, Souls-like. Again, the specter of Dark Souls rose up from the murky depths of my childhood memories, tempting me toward its cold embrace. 
If I could beat and enjoy both Hyper Light Drifter and Monster Hunter World, and their gameplay truly was Souls-like, maybe I could survive the hardship and toil of FromSoft's modern offerings. The seed that Bloodborne planted began to grow, but it would still need to wait to bloom. It would nearly perish on the vine when I first saw gameplay from Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, but some life remained in it yet. That life would remain in stasis, quietly waiting for its moment in the sun, until 2023, when I finally booted up Elden Ring. Elden Ring, two-part mm. question. Mm. Number one, what is your Soulsborne experience before Elden Ring? Zero Soulsborne experience prior to this. Number um, two, are you going to keep playing it or? Not immediately. <laughs> Now, after this many hours of exploring the vast world of Elden Ring, I can't say that I like it, but I am fascinated by it. I'm fascinated by an eternally moonlit plateau. I'm fascinated by a world of endless night buried under the earth. I'm fascinated by a city huddled under the calcified husks of monstrous dragons, a city etched with the markings of an ancient war, whose gold-adorned homes seem to have melted under the heat of draconic fire, permanently sealing many of them shut. I'm fascinated by a clifftop village enveloped in crawling pink flowers. At first, the Infestation is subtle, wreaths of blossoms tacked to the doors of eerily quiet homes, leading upward from the valley to the heavens. But then the blooms become more dense, creeping and crawling along stone, dirt, and dilapidated wooden structures. And then comes the laughter, quiet at first and then more present, rising, falling, but never ceasing. And at the highest point of this forlorn village, in the shadow of myriad gently spinning windmills, dancing in a sea of blushing blooms are people. Just dancing, laughing, completely oblivious to anything but their own motion and the unsettling cacophony of their mirth. Oblivious to the edge of my blade until I cut the first of them down. I'm fascinated by a castle, half sunk in a poison bog, the outer ward populated by all kinds of unseemly denizens keen on ending my life in whatever way they can, but the inner bailey is something else entirely. There is little motion within the bailey save for a few miscreants intent on skewering me from the shadows. Within these walls is a world of stone populated by a statuesque people, their forms cracked and crumbling, huddled together, perhaps in family units, perhaps otherwise, just quietly existing. Were these statues once flesh and blood, or are they the work of a lonely sculptor as yet unseen, slowly chiseling out a world all their own? My gut assumes this is the work of a curse rather than a creation, though whether such tragedy came at the hand of chance or deliberate malevolence I'll never truly know. Would petrification be more painless than a different death? Maybe if it were instantaneous, a quick flash to stone rather than the slow exsanguination of the blade. Whatever darkness took this place, whatever evil befell it, Perhaps in its forming of these stony people, it showed some mercy to those nearest the heart of this castle. Elden Ring is a game that, despite everything, I can't help but keep wanting to explore. Everything about it demands you investigate it further. Very rarely is anything marked on the map, but occasionally another character or even the description of an item might point you in the right direction. Runes dropped from bosses will tell you where to go to recharge them. A, a key given to you by another character might not explicitly tell you what door it unlocks, but it will point you 
towards its destination. Maybe you're exploring up near the furthest northern edge of the map, and you come across yet another dilapidated ruin. But in this one, there is a lone jellyfish. And I think she's saying something. Sister, where did you go? Hmm, you think to yourself, a, a jellyfish who has become separated from their sister? Why does that sound familiar? Well because you have the ability to bring her dead sister back to life, at, at least for a time. You might recall that, hidden amongst your likely, at this point, expansive collection of spirit ashes, are the ashes of a spirit jellyfish. And in her description, you'll find the usual explanations of what she does when summoned, but curiously, you'll also note that her description says she's prone to tears and searches for her distant home. It also tells you her name. Aurelia. If you read this and it stuck in your mind as it did in mine, perhaps you would do then as I did and summon Aurelia's spirit to be with her sister. They'll both ascend to the stars shortly after. It's these kinds of little details that make the world of Elden Ring so compelling to me, even if holistically I'm not really vibing with it. And yet, maybe that's the point of it all. My character, me, a, a tarnished, is out of place in this world, and the most recent in a long lineage of banished warriors cast out yet compelled to return to this place. I am an anathema. Everything in this world is set against me, and yet I am compelled to traverse the lands between. I am compelled to cut down the demigods one by one. And if I had chosen not to continue playing after I'd beat Margit, that too could be read as a logical conclusion to the story of my particular Tarnished. With one great enemy felled, perhaps the Light of Grace would leave me, and I would be lost in the lands between, aimless as so many of my fellow Tarnished are and were. But the Light of Grace was not lost to me. And so was I carried onward, further toward the Erd Tree, further towards the Elden Ring. Huh. Maybe I do like Elden Ring. This is uh, Jake Terrio with Subpixel. Um, Will says I can't come back to the studio unless you like and subscribe. And if you leave a comment, he even says he'll give me a warm uh, blanket. So uh, please do that, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you in the next video.